but we do want to get to an important story that happened earlier this week. Take a look at your screen. Russian President Vladimir Putin giving an interview to U.S. TV host Tucker Carlson on Tuesday, his first to an American journalist since before Russia's invasion of Ukraine nearly two years ago. To discuss, we're joined by Alex Gorbachev, a reporter with Voice of America's Russian service. Uh, Alex, we appreciate your time as always. Good to see you, Austin. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Let's get right into the news here because, uh, you know, this this was the images seen around the world so far at this point. Uh, the interview began with a 25-minute monologue by Putin about history leading up to the current conflict. They also discussed Putin's territorial goals. Uh, Alex, do you think the Kremlin got what it wanted with this interview? That's a great question, Austin, and it's good that you picked on the word monologue because that's precisely how many journalists who analyzed the whole interview referred to it like it was more more like a monologue or rather than an actual interview uh getting back to your question if uh Kremlin achieved what he wanted. Uh, I think uh, their goal with this interview was to reach broader Western audiences, American conservatives in particular, uh, because Kremlin is very interested in influencing uh, election in America. And they wanted to reach the audience, but they also wanted to dodge uh, tough questions. So uh, they used uh, Tucker Carlson as an opportunity to do that. Uh, as for this historical monologue, I don't want to uh, go there for a long time, but just a glimpse of how historically accurate was it. For example, he was uh, talking a lot about so-called denazification of Ukraine, and he said that he spoke to President Zelensky and uh, that uh, he brought up that Zelensky's father fought uh, during the World War II and that he asked uh, Zelensky and then Zelensky didn't have uh, nothing to respond to that. Just a brief fact, uh, Zelensky's father uh, was born in 1947 and the World War II ended, uh, ended in uh, 1945. So that's uh, kind of a, a glimpse of uh, historical perspective and uh, his Putin's interpretation of history in the beginning of the interview. So journalists, they had to do a lot of fact-checking when uh, covering this. And some of the fact-checking that's been done, what, what has come of that? Uh, what were, and I suppose there was a lot of fact-checking to be done. Was there anything in particular that stood out to you, maybe? Well, uh, this particular part stood out because it was uh, historically in inaccurate and he just, uh, it looks like, and some journalists assume that he just made up uh, this uh, conversation with the president of Ukraine. Uh, it was just his interpretation of history mostly and his interpretation of the invasion of Ukraine. I wish we would see some tough questions that would reveal uh, Putin's real intention intentions in Ukraine, but unfortunately, we didn't see that. I want to get to another important part of this story. Uh, Putin uh, said that Russia is ready to negotiate a prisoner exchange for Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Uh, this has been a story uh, that we've been following closely. He was jailed in March 2023 on espionage charges that he denies. Um, Alex, did Putin give any indication uh, this week as to what it would take in order to get Evan back? Uh, he wants to exchange it to uh, convict a criminal, to convict kin a killer who murdered uh, uh, some uh, person in Berlin a few years ago. And I think uh, maybe it was initial goal for Kremlin when they captivated Gershkovich. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, I don't have any insights of that, but it looks, it looks like that Kremlin is very interested in exchanging Gershkovich to that guy, to Vadim Krasikov, uh, because Putin brought it, up, uh, brought it up during the interview, as I predicted two days ago when we uh, spoke with you. And the reason why Kremlin is uh, interested in, exchange, in exchanging Gershkovich to that particular guy, uh, in my opinion, it can be related to the crime uh, Hiller committed, because uh, Kremlin some uh, Kremlin is notorious for poisoning people overseas, for killing people overseas. And if the exchange will happen, they will just show that uh, it will be easier to record killers to kill someone overseas because they can show, see, it will be just a few years in prison and we will just uh, 
exchange you, swap you with some American journalist or some American we will just catch in Moscow. But like in a few years, you will be released as a, a free man and we'll give you a, a bunch of money. The Wall Street Journal has been sending out a lot of messages on social media regarding uh, Evans' capture. Uh, Putin says that he was caught red-handed, and when I say he, I mean Evan was caught red-handed breaking espionage laws. Uh, how safe are reporters in Russia at this point, Alex, specifically independent non-state journalists that are within the country? I knew Evan personally when I was working in Moscow. I met him. He was a brilliant guy. And I think this uh, espionage law, Kremlin uses it specifically to target journalists. So I think it, Evan's case is very clear indication of how, how safe it is to work and to do any reporting in Russia. As a matter of fact, Kremlin, they outlawed, uh, Kremlin outlawed any investigative reporting on the war in, uh, with Ukraine uh, in Russia. So they implemented uh, foreign agent laws, uh, uh, fake news laws, uh, other laws. So for example, if you will just call the war war, not special military operation, how they call it, it will be a violation of the Russian law and they can prosecute you. Same if you will just report on war crimes, it will be a violation of the Russian law and uh, journalists who report, uh, they may face a uh, few years uh, in prison or more. If they want to uh, imprisoned person for longer time, they will use espionage charges or terrorism charges. Uh, like with a Spanish char with a Spanish charge, again, Evan, uh, Evan's case is a very clear example. And Putin is afraid of any investigative uh, reporting of any critical reporting. So that's why they kicked out almost uh, virtually every uh, media organization which would report from Russia in Russian language, uh, because uh, Putin doesn't want to answer questions from uh, journalists. Another big talking point that they were speaking of was uh, foreign affairs, and we have a tweet that's from Poland's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in the interview, Putin said he will not invade Poland unless Poland invades Russia, that he does not have territorial aims across the entire continent, and that a global war would bring the whole uh, of humanity to the brink of extinction. That Those are Putin's words from the interview. Uh, do you think these kind of words will mean anything to the West? Or, or, or do many Western leaders oftentimes take statements like this with a grain of salt? Grain of salt, uh, to say the least. Uh, his part about Poland, it was a very bizarre part of the interviews. Of the interview, uh, my colleagues, they uh, counted that he used, the, he pronounced the word Poland 36 times during this interview. And it's actually pretty alarming because uh, Previously, he was talking a lot about Ukraine before the invasion, and we see what's happening now. He also, uh, I don't want to repeat like his uh, anti-Western and anti-Ukrainian and anti-Polish propaganda, but he made some very weird statements about like uh, territory or, or modern borders of Poland. So it's something uh, definitely, uh, I think some Western leaders definitely will be concerned about it. I saw some statements from a uh, Danish defense minister who said that uh, Russia's war with NATO uh, may happen in like three to five years. Previously, I saw similar projections from German officials, from uh, from Norway, uh, from Sweden. Officials were indicating that uh, direct conflict between with, bet between Russia and NATO is something uh, which is not inevitable inevitable, but it's certainly one of scenarios uh, which can be considered in the future. And another point regarding his comments on Poland, uh, sometimes and pretty often PT, uh, Putin uh, does exactly opposite uh, from what he is saying. Remember, he was saying that he uh, will not invade Ukraine. Previously, he was denying any ties with the uh, Wagner Group, with Prigozhin, and later he acknowledged that uh, Russian state, as a matter of fact, uh, fact funded uh, Wagner's group from budget for uh, many years, and it received billions of rubles from uh, Russian budget. I did, like, and if we will go 
uh, like in early 2000s, he many times confirmed, uh, he many times indicated that he doesn't have desire to be president, uh, president for more than two terms. And they will see it's 24th year of his presidency and he is still there. How is Russian media covering this interview? Uh, do they see it in a different light than we do, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, depending on like what media, so Russian state-run media, they're glorifying Putin. They uh, cover the interview extensively. Tucker Carlson is the most popular American journalist in Russia now, uh, because like basically what the coverage is that uh, Carlson with this interview, he was able to break through the iron curtain of Western censorship. So Putin was able to uh, reach Western audiences with his view of the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so, like, and uh, also Russian media, they uh, indicate and um, that uh, it garnered over 150 millions of views. So a lot of people saw that, and a lot more of people will see that. As for, I mean, st st that's how st state-run media cover it. If we will talk about independent media, it's a completely different story because Russian independent media, and as I can see from comments of Russian independent journalists, they were offended by uh, the fact how uh, Carlson presented himself in Moscow because when he announced the interview, he said that no Western journalist ever bothered to interview Putin. And it's simply not true because a lot of Western journalists were trying to uh, get uh, uh, an access to Putin. They were sending re requests to interview him and all of them, they were rejected by the Kremlin and Kremlin confirmed it. Also for, I don't even recall when the last time Putin would talk with a Russian independent journalist one-on-one. -on -one. I don't remember it. And even long before the war for uh, Russian independent journalist, it would take, it would be extremely difficult to even ask a question to Putin because during one or two press conferences uh, a year that where journalists would be able to meet him, uh, it was very difficult uh, to get there. And he was, and Kremlin normally, they would ban a lot of independent journalists uh, from even getting to that press conference. Were there any questions, Alex, that you would have liked to have touched on? Is there anything that you felt like you would have wanted to ask if you had been there? Uh, getting back to the beginning of our interview, you mentioned this uh, 25 minutes monologue, and he felt very confident confident with Carlson explaining his view of uh, some absolutely irrelevant historical events uh, which happened 100 years ago or more, which do not have uh, any, uh, which are irrelevant to current invasion to Ukraine. And I would ask Putin if instead he would be willing to meet one-on-one -on -one with mothers of Russian or Ukrainian soldiers who were murdered uh, as a result of Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, and explain them why one day he decided uh, to do denazification, how he calls it, of Ukraine and explain, the, explain to them one-on-one, -on -one, like with Carlson, why their kids died and why they had to pay uh, this price. I would ask him why Russia didn't prosecute a single uh, war criminal because uh, Russian army soldiers committed a lot of war crimes in Ukraine. And those are well-documented uh, crimes, rapes, mutilations, tortures. That that's what people do with each other uh, during the war. And there are uh, plenty of evidences uh, captured by international human rights organizations by UN. Uh, they have uh, like audio, uh, they tracked phone calls of Russian soldiers who revealed that they killed civilians or they stole something or someone raped someone and they saw that. Or there are also a bunch of videos which are being analyzed by prosecutors now. So I would ask uh, that. And of course, I would ask about political prisoners in Russia, Alexei Navalny, Vladimir Karamurza, 
uh, Ilya Yashin and a lot of other political prisoners who are currently uh, not, they're not just in prison, but they're also being tortured, tortured like Navalny and Karamurza. They're in solitary confinements with a, they're deprived of uh, health care. They're deprived of, uh, deprived of the right to meet their lawyers. They cannot see or talk to their families because all of them are, uh, all of their family members are in exile. And there are hundreds of other political prisoners in Russia. So I would ask about that for sure. But the problem is that Putin doesn't meet independent journalists who are from Russia. He doesn't want to face questions from them. I do want to ask one more question about the Ukraine war. Uh, let's just talk about what the big news was before we move away here. This happening within the past uh, 24 hours or so, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky announced uh, Thursday that he replaced the country's top military general. What led to this, uh, Alex? Why did he do this? What, why, why the change of pace here? So a few months ago, Austin, uh, media reported that there is a schism or a split between Zelensky and Zaluzhny, who was uh, Ukrainian army commander in chief, uh, after Zaluzhny's interview to The Economist, where he said that uh, there is a stalemate on the front line, that uh, uh, what we'll see afterwards is just long, exhausting war, and uh, there is no obvious uh, solution of what to do and uh, highly likely we will not see one side or another side to uh, defeat and uh, I think Zelensky and it was clear from uh, Zelensky comments uh, that uh, he has different opinion that he thinks that Ukraine has potential to uh, draft to mobilize more soldiers that Ukraine was able to withstand Russian aggression within few days after the invasion uh, without uh, Western military aid and that Ukraine would be able to fight Russia even uh, without Western aid. Uh, even though it would be much harder, as he acknowledged. And he doesn't think that the war can be over because uh, before uh, Ukraine would liberate uh, occupied territories. And uh, as of now, Russia is occupying uh, around 20% of the Ukrainian territory. And as for new head of Ukrainian military, as a new commander in chief, they assigned Alexander Sirsky. It's a very well-known uh, military officer, as I recall, he was in charge of ground forces of Ukraine, uh, and he was credited a lot for uh, defending Kyiv in the first day of the invasion, and it was crucial, uh, because after the defense of Kyiv, uh, Russian forces withdrew uh, from, uh, from the Ukrainian, uh, from the vicinity of Ukrainian capital, and his Pretty, he has good reputation. He is pretty popular among uh, Ukrainian military community, and as I understand, in Ukrainian society as well. As for his strategy, we simply don't know. He didn't comment on that. So I think in the upcoming in the upcoming weeks, we will see uh, more of what changed uh, in Ukraine. The two-year anniversary of this uh, war coming up pretty soon here. Alex Gorbachev, as always, we appreciate your time. Take care. Thanks for having me, Austin.